First of all, this is not sponsored by HB Omen. They might not like what I'm about to say, so let's go for it. This guy over here is the HB Omen Transcend 14, and this is the biggest competitor to the Asus Zephyrus G14, which is a very popular laptop out there. Now, I've tried some Omen laptops before. This is a very interesting one because this has the most powerful Intel Ultra chip that's available right now, the Intel Ultra 9, and a lot more. It compacts it into this 14 inch form factor and the design is improved so let's take a look at this laptop and if this is worth buying because you're gonna have to cash out two thousand dollars for this and there might be some better alternatives looking for a cheap way to license your windows check out who keys through the links in the video description make sure to use the code tn20 to get 25 percent off use your preferred payment method including paypal or bank card go to your orders and copy the key paste the license to the activation settings and you're all done this license is for windows 10 but you can upgrade it to windows 11 for free or you can buy windows 11 pro key instead they also offer microsoft office 19 license use the same code tn20 to get 25 percent off check out whokeys.com in the video description below i want to tear it apart and see what's inside so to the back of the laptop you pull it that way because these little latches here they hook behind there so what we can see over here is our 70 watt hour battery in the front some speakers dual fan system and a huge vapor chamber what it looks like there is an rtx 4070 mobile gpu as well as the intel core ultra 9 185h here we can see a little heatsink for our SSD, which seems to be Western Digital SN810. So if needed to, you can replace the SSD. Now, the cooling is pretty impressive, which you'll see in a moment. There is nothing operatable in here apart from the SSD. Nothing else, everything is soldered on. That's the air intake and then out from the back. What we can see here is a Thunderbolt 4 and a headphone and my combo jack on the left side of the laptop. On the back of the laptop, we have a HDMI port, a USB-C charging port, as well as data connection if needed to. And on the right side, we have two USB type A ports. As much as I love the design and I like where they're going with this, at the same time, the build quality is okay. You can see that there is quite a lot of flex when pressing down in there. If we're opening the screen, look how much the screen flexes left and right. There is quite a bit of screen flex. That's what I've noticed with quite a few of the HP laptops, especially the Omen 16 as well that has the RTX 4080. Very similar thing, quite a bit of screen flex. And chassis flex is not too bad. It doesn't feel cheap, but when we're looking at the screen, the screen is quite wobbly and doesn't go all the way down. Another very annoying thing is opening the laptop. Now, if you want to open this, there, there is no real easy way to open this, especially with one hand. You have to use two hands. That's very weird. Not a big fan. In terms of fingerprints, as you can see, there are a few on it. It's not the worst, but it's not the best either. That's why I recommend the white version as well, because it will look a little bit better. Other than that, I'm really enjoying the design now i do wish this had the hp logo in here because hp has a lot more minimal logo if you remember the dragonfly g14 has a really nice logo in there hp much nicer than omen takes a bit more space so now this laptop has windows hello as you can see it's already worked there's no fingerprint reader or anything else this is a 2.8k oled display that is 14 inches, 16 by 10 aspect ratio, and it looks gorgeous. It's up to 120 hertz, and if you've got the new Windows feature that has the dynamic refresh rate, it will change it automatically from 120 to 60 to save battery life in there. I've seen some people online that can reduce this display to even 24 hertz, which is interesting because if you're watching Netflix films or some films which are 24 frames per second, you can save even more battery life rather than running at 60 hertz or so on. This one over here goes only to 48 hertz, the lowest. Now the color space is 100% DCIe P3, which is very wide color gamut, and it does support 10-bit display. But that's the weird thing about Windows laptops. You only get 10-bit when you are plugged in. As you can see right now, it's 8-bit and we're not gonna get it. Even if we go to HDR, HDR video streaming is on, but it is not 10-bit. Now, in order to make the display run 10-bit, all you have to do is plug in the laptop, and if we go to HDR now. Interestingly, on this laptop, it doesn't seem to be working. There might be some settings somewhere, 
but I can't find it. Let me know if you know in the comment section below. Let's talk about the keyboard and trackpad and then finally the performance. So keyboard, I've got nothing bad to say. I am very much enjoying the typing experience. It's very nice, smooth key travel, good feedback and I'm really enjoying typing on this. On the other hand, the trackpad is not my favorite at all. Now, it doesn't slide as well as on the MacBooks. I've been recently using uh, the MacBook Airs, but even the 2020 MacBook Air, that costs less than half, probably like quarter of the price, third of the price has a nicer trackpad than this one over here. Now, when the laptop is plugged in, it's a little bit better. The trackpad kind of is very nice and sensitive and whenever I'm moving it, it reacts to my touch very, very fast. Now, when I don't have the power plug in, for some reason, the trackpad starts to be very, very stuttery and feels very choppy playback. The Dragonfly G4 was much better. The ZenBook 14 OLED with the Ultra 7 is much better. This is one of the worst trackpad experiences I have ever had. So if you are planning to use this for your performance, I highly recommend getting an external mouse like this Logitech MX Master 3S, one of my favorite mice. So keyboard and touchpad, kind of a mixed feelings there. Now, before we move on to the performance, I want to talk about the power brick, which is actually quite a large power brick. So this is 140 watts USB type C, and that's all it does. It's a very long cable. You've got the Mickey Mouse kind of a cable end, and then USB-C that comes out from the back. If you like to be very portable, I highly recommend checking out something like the Ugreen 140 watt USB-C charger. Now I know this is quite expensive, but there are some cheaper versions available. Let's go into the performance now. This is quite a powerful laptop. Now we've got Ultra 9 as the CPU. For memory, we've got 32 gigs of RAM. This is DDR5 and it's running very, very fast because it's soldered onto the motherboard and very close to the CPU. It's running 7,467 megahertz, which is pretty insane. Now this is the maximum we're gonna get. You're not gonna get 64, that's it. You do have the MPU or Intel AI little neural engine as well, which is not gonna do much for you, especially as the gaming laptop. I don't know what you're gonna do with this. We have the NVIDIA RTX 4070 laptop GPU with eight gigabytes of VRAM, which will be nice for those doing 3D rendering. The cool thing is it's got Wi-Fi 7 in here. So if you've got a router in the house that matches this, you're gonna get very nice internet speeds. Now, when talking about browsing, firstly, speedometer 3.0. You feel free to do the test on your PC, but here are the results what this guy gets. 16.4, I've got 20-21% when I'm taking some of the tabs off, something like that. It's not particularly fast. If we go speedometer 2.0, 296 points on speedometer 2.0. That's probably around 40% slower than what you would have on the MacBook Pro M3 Max but feel free to test them out. So then, Cinebench R24, and even though this is not particularly good benchmark in terms of overall performance, and that's where my personal opinion about the, you know, usability and snappiness of the laptop comes in that we spoke about earlier, but here's some interesting results actually. You can see that the single core score is 107 points, but on battery it's 106%, which means that whether you're running it on battery or on power, it's pretty much exactly the same. Now, in terms of multi-core score, we're getting 842 points, which is a half of what you were getting on the Asus Pro at 16 with 24 cores. Obviously, it's a lot more powerful and 16 inch form factor. So it's not particularly amazing, but you're using up to 54 watts when you're plugged in on the laptop. The multi-core score on battery is 716. So we're still use, losing about 15% performance when we're not plugged in. But the interesting thing is when we're using the battery power, it does actually boost to 58 watts. So slightly more even than on when we're plugged in, which means that the power draw is not an issue. It gets enough power from the battery or from the power plug, but for some reason we're 15% slower, which is interesting. And this shouldn't be like that, which makes me wonder what's going on. In terms of the cooling, if we're running this Cinebench R24 multi-core test for 10 minutes, you can see we're losing 0.71% of the performance, which means in 10 minutes, the cooling is very, very good. No problems there at all. But the most interesting thing for this one is that on battery, we're still getting the same power draw as we would get on plugged in, but for some reason, the performance is lower, so it can't sustain them speeds. Maybe the battery is not as good sustaining the power load, but little boosts of power load we can pull on the battery, but that's that. Some of the benchmarks I'm just browsing through, but so you can see them as well. Geekbench 6 here. Let's move on to Photoshop and some of the creative applications. If you're thinking about using this for Photoshop, it's mediocre at best. As you can see, 
even the MacBook Air M3 is scoring quite a bit faster as you can see there. The MacBooks and Apple Silicon is incredibly fast in Photoshop. So if you do in Photoshop, the MacBooks might be a better pick for you because we can't utilize the DGPU and the single core performance isn't as good as what you get on the MacBooks. Lightroom Classic score here if you want to check that one out. And now video editing in Premiere Pro. The video editing is okay. Now it's not quite as fast as on the Asus Pro Art Studio Book, especially when you're looking at the long GOP scores. The new Ultra should have very good media engines inside, but for some reason it's not quite working as well. Even though the RAM is really, really fast, which means that the iGPU kind of a VRAM would come from the actual RAM chip is not as fast as you can see on the Studiobook Pro 16. So it's not shining in video editing, but it's not bad either. Here's the After Effects score. And I've only now started to populate these databases for laptops. They'll be soon coming more. So if you want to see some in the future, stick around. I'm going to be populating this for future videos as well. In Dorinto Resolve, you can see the score there as well. Not much to compare yet. Here's Redshift, GPU rendering, Octane Bench, and now Blender CPU rendering. The CPU rendering for this, it's okay. The Ultra 9 isn't going to be like the very CPU effective performance, but it's very good for the form factor. In Blender GPU, if you're using the iGPU on the Ultra 9, you're gonna get a little bit faster scores than on the CPU, probably around two times, almost two times as fast. But the RTX 4070 is insane, and we're getting very similar scores as what we'd get on the MacBook Pro M3 Max GPU, which is a 40 core GPU, and is almost double the price, which is insane GPU rendering performance. Here's V-Ray if you want to check it out. But I want to go back to Redshift for a minute, because as you can see, if we're doing the score plugged in, the laptop gets around 9,400 points, which is pretty insane. In 30 minutes, the score hasn't gone down very much, so it cools it down very, very well. But if we're doing it on battery, for some reason, we're losing about 30% of the score roughly which doesn't make sense because if you're looking at the power draw of the gpu on battery and on plugged in modes both of them max window settings we can deliver the amount of power on the gpu on battery but for some reason we're not on when we plugged in we're roughly around 46 watts on the power brick and then on battery you're pulling about 28 watts for some reason it's limited even though when we're on the cpu you know that we're delivering around 50 plus watts to the CPU, which means it can deliver the same to the GPU, like a 46 watts when we're plugged in. But for some reason, it's not, and I don't know why. It should have the same score on battery power as it is plugged in. So the conclusion then, is this laptop worth it and should you buy it for $2,000? Now, there are cheaper options of this available with RTX 4060 and 4050, but, for creators, maybe this small form factor could be interesting. And I'd say if you are a Windows user and you swear by it, maybe this is one of the best you can get that's out there. But if you just want the best creator laptop and the best usability, I have some other options that I would consider. Now, if you're not doing particularly heavy video editing and you're just cutting video and you're not going in GPU effects and very complex timelines and using DaVinci Resolve for masking and denoising and color grading, then there is cheaper options available like the ZenBook 14 OLED that I tested. I'm liking the overall usability much more and it's much lighter than this one. Battery ba life is much longer. It's just not very powerful GPU because it only has integrated graphics. This dedicated graphics makes sense only for those doing GPU rendering in 3D or people very heavy in DaVinci Resolve that can utilize all this GPU power. But at that point, if you're looking just for overall best experience for your laptop, if you go in on Best Buy, you can get the Apple MacBook Pro 14 inch laptop with M 3 Pro chip, 18 gigs of RAM, and it's only 18 gigabytes and only 512 gigabyte SSD, but it's $150 cheaper and overall experience will be much better on the MacBook Pro. Your battery life is going to be faster. Now, it's not going to be as good on in 3D rendering. If you're doing that, this is this Omen 14 is for you. But if you're doing video editing or photo editing, the MacBook, I'm sorry to say, is a better option. If you want to expand the storage, you've got $150 to get something external which kind of makes sense. And the way the Mac OS works with the unified memory, it's not going to be bad experience. 
and the resale value for this MacBook is going to be a lot more in two, three years time than this HP Omen here. As you can see, the conclusion is kind of mixed feelings because if you do need 14 inch form factor and portable kind of GPU rendering powerhouse as a creator, then this is a very interesting option for $2,000. And for those who like gaming on 14 inch, very, very good as well. You're going to enjoy the OLED screen, which is not as good as the MacBook Pro 14 inch. But if you're doing color grading and more color accuracy and so on, the MacBook is going to be a better option for you, especially for creators. I feel photo video editing, the MacBook is going to be a better option because you save $150. So think carefully if you need the dedicated GPU RTX 4070. If you do, this is the one for you. If not, there's some better options available. I'll leave them linked in the description below. Let me know what you think in the comment section below.